So I actually did not get a scholarship to go to Rhode Island. I got was offered a scholarship at another school and I turned it down. I was like, I want to run D1. I want to be with a big, big fish, even if I'm small right now. Traveling, yeah, traveling on the bus and just hanging out with them and, you know, the stupid stories that you remember of the things that you probably shouldn't have done, but you still did it anyway. So. <laughs> a lot of it will be like hit training or like training to failure. So I really like to push my, my mind and my body that way and get really uncomfortable because you have no choice if you're going to do it correctly. And it's worked out really well for me, so. Hey, welcome back to another rep. My name's Steve Hagen. I love this show because I love learning about everybody's stories, what they, where they came from, where they are, where they're going, all that kind of stuff. Today's no different. We're going to meet Miss Emily Renna, and you're going to love her story. But before we get there, hit like, hit subscribe, hit the bells, do everything you got to do, and then share this with your people. Let's go get another rep. Let's go, Miss Emily. Let's go. Miss Emily, thank you so much for coming on another rep with me. <laughs> what a blessing this is. Um, Emily Renna is, uh, well, I'm not even going to spoil your story. You're going to tell us your story. <laughs> um, but what an athlete. You're an athlete. We're going we're gonna to start with that. And uh, let's let's go back to where you grew up and all that kind of stuff. And then take us to what you're doing now. So um, I don't even know how old you are. <laughs> so we can go yeah, from can zero to wherever you are right now. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I'll give you the whole life story. And I just want to say before we start, thank you so much for having me on here. Um, really, really thankful that Elliot suggested it. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so life story. Uh, I grew up in a suburb of Rochester, New York called Fairport. Went to Fairport High School. Um, Sports-wise, growing up, when I was really little, I did gymnastics for I don't know, maybe a year or two. And then I actually got into karate for about 10 years, martial arts. Oh. Yeah, a little different. Um, my mom would not let me play travel soccer. She was like, pick a different sport where I don't have to drive you around all the time. <laughs> like martial arts. I don't know why. Um, but really loved it. And the discipline in that sport, it, it taught me a lot that I feel like has carried over into a lot of aspects of my life. Um, and then I played a little bit of soccer in middle school. and then. When I got to high school, actually, I ran track in middle school, too. So I started in about seventh grade. Um, but yeah, track really became my sport. Ran that in high school. Was named co-athlete of the year my senior year. Let's go. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. So my teammate was the other one who got it. And her and I actually both ended up at the University of Rhode Island and ran track together there. What were you, so what I was were there your events at the track event? Oh, gosh. Uh, dabbled in a lot of short sprints. My specialty really was the 60 meter hurdles indoors and then outdoors is 100 meter hurdles. Um, dabbled in some long jump, some triple jump, would also run the four by one relay, 200 meters, anything above that. I begged my coach not to put me in. <laughs> Those <laughs> events hurt. Vault? So, <laughs> no, I really wanted to try pole vaulting in high school. And my coaches wouldn't let me. They're like, you're too good at everything else that you do. So, no. <laughs> Could have been yeah. a pentathlete or whatever. Isn't it a pentathlete in girls? That uh, it is pentathlon indoors for women, and it's the heptathlon outdoors. But we don't have pole vault. That's actually part of the decathlon. So, yeah. So you went from yeah, the, I, high school in New York all the way out to Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah. I when I was applying to colleges was really adamant about not going to school in New York State. <laughs> Oh. I was like, I refuse to go to school in New York State. So I applied to a lot of schools Why in is that? England. And I was over being there <laughs> and the weather, which is funny because I ended up at school in New England and the weather is just as bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Applied to schools in New England and North Carolina so, uh, that way and just fell in love with Rhode Island. So very good cool. Fit. <laughs> so yeah. did you run track all four years at Rhode Island? Yeah, so all four of my undergrad, and then I actually got a fifth year because my freshman year I had a red shirt due to I got mono, um, and at the time it was pretty devastating. But actually, it was really a blessing in disguise because I got to get that fifth year, and it was part of my first year of grad school. So it paid for my first year of grad school actually being able Very to do cool. that, and I was a much better athlete at that point too. So um, it worked out really well. <laughs> What'd you major in? Uh, kinesiology or exercise science. Very cool. Yep. Then, yeah, so I got my bachelor's in that and master's. What's your master's in? 
same thing. <laughs> so science? Yep, exercise science. So how are you making money right now? Are you a exercise <laughs> scientist? Physical it's funny. Therapy? I actually, <laughs> I don't do anything with my degree. So right now my full-time job on top of being a bobsled athlete is I work for a biotech company out of Rockville, Maryland, which is we'll say like 40 minutes outside of DC. Um, and I'm a clinical sample manager. You probably don't know what that is. It's a very niche role. Um, but basically, so <laughs> yeah, so I work on all of our rare studies and that just refers to like rare disease. So study or diseases that you've probably never heard of. Um, but with the sample management, I'm responsible for all the vendor contracts that we have with the third party labs that test all of these samples and basically coordinating the samples from one lab to another and then making sure that we test them in a certain amount of time and then we get data on them and get the data in-house. That's pretty much a good summary of what I do. And you can do that everywhere, wherever you're at. Yeah. Yeah. I've been remote since COVID hit um, and I basically just take my computer everywhere, wherever I am. So. That's super cool. <laughs> hey, let's go back a little bit to your growing up years. Um, sure. How many... Are you the oldest, the youngest, middle? What are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm the oldest. Um, like I said, my family, my family uh, split when I was pretty young. So I've got a full sister that I share my mom and dad. I have a half sister on my mom's side, and then a half sister, a half brother, and a stepsister on my dad's side. So there's a lot of us growing up. Cool. Yeah. And then I'm sure yeah. you were like, so you're the oldest of everybody. So you yes. were. How'd you get into yeah. athletics? You just, you were just in your DNA. I, I think that's part of it. Um, I know my dad played rugby in college. I'm not quite sure what my mom did. Um, but growing up as kids, we were outside all the time, like with our siblings and like our neighborhood friends that we grew up with always playing games or yeah. different sports, like constantly. And I always just remember being fast and pretty athletic. Faster um, than all the boys. Yeah, they didn't like that. <laughs> and by the time I got to yeah, by the time I got to middle school, I was like, I'm pretty fast. Like I'm gonna do track, and that really was where my journey started with, like track and field at least. So yeah, yeah, super yeah, yeah. cool. So then you became. So tell us more about Rhode Island. When you went over there to run, did you become mm -hmm. like world class sprinter or something? Something. Uh so the story is like. Uh, what the word is that I want here. So I actually did not get a scholarship to go to Rhode Island. I got was offered a scholarship at another school and I turned it down. I was like, I want to run D1. I want to be with a big, big fish, even if I'm small right now. Um, and really worked my way up and got pretty good where I ended up basically earning a full-time scholarship on top of my academic scholarship. And then I eventually got to a point where I broke one of our indoor records and the hurdles. Let's go. Um, and then yeah, things just got better from there. Uh, did really well my last year to, uh, I'm trying to think, what are my accolades? God, this track feels like it was so long ago. Now I'm in this bobsled world. Um, I know I won the New England Championship two years in a row in 60-meter hurdles. Um, I ended up winning at, an Atlantic 10 Conference Championship in the 100-meter hurdles. And then I have some other medals from like the 4 by one relay that I would run just as well. So that's always fun. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you miss the most about college track? Oh, gosh. I mean, I still have teammates now, but like those teammates is just different. And I have some really good friends from, from that group that I definitely miss and I don't get to see because we all live in different parts of the US. Um, but I really just miss competing in hurdles. Like I, I just love that event. And now that I don't get to do it, it's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started a yeah. online, um, it's called a virtual locker room kind of thing and it was based on okay. what is what do you guys and it's for men only sorry about that but uh oh, sorry. <laughs> i said uh <laughs> what do you guys miss the most and they said the locker room and it's just you know it's not always the we always miss the competition right that's when you get yeah yeah, yeah. but they miss the camaraderie of mm -hmm. the teammates like your teammates traveling yeah. on the bus and yep. working on each other and all that yep Traveling, yeah, traveling on the bus and just hanging out with them and, you know, the stupid stories that you remember of the things that you probably shouldn't have done, but you still did it anyways. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, those are really the memories. That is, that's super cool. So how do you go from being yeah. a track 
you know, to bobsled. I mean, <laughs> heck, <laughs> how's that work out? Yeah, so I know. Our story. How did you get that? And did you even think about, well, I think I'm going to go be, when all this track is done, I'm going to go be a bobsledder. Yeah, I'll give you the story. So once I finished running track, I was still in grad school at Rhode Island. And so I had one more year, um, had to do like a thesis and everything to get my master's degree. And then from there, I was like, all right, I'm just going to go join the corporate world, be like everyone else in the U.S. Um, and I got to that and I was like, I don't enjoy this. Yeah, I was like, I don't. <laughs> I don't enjoy this. I was like, I am too competitive. Like I need something in that space where I can go compete again, whatever it is. Um, wasn't really interested in CrossFit, not interested in getting into distance running, which I know a lot of my teammates got into. And I was like, no, I want to be like really competitive. And a girl that I had competed against, I remember from track meets in high school and like our state level track and field meet was really good. She ended up, uh, at USA bobsled as a bobsledder. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do that. So I kind of sat on it for a few years um, and then was like, I'm gonna go try out. Like, I think I can do this. And I had worked with a coach in the area. He helped me get back to being a competitive sprinter essentially, because I would go to the gym and work out, but it's not the same to train for a sport versus just oh, working no. out the workout. Right. Um, so I had to get back to the sprinting and like, okay, tell everybody the difference because I know the difference, but tell everybody <laughs> the difference. Yeah. When you go to the gym, yeah, like, work out, to be, it's different. <laughs> it's different. It's different when you just go and you're like, I think I might do this today versus where you have a plan and a structure where you're like, okay, I need to do this as my foundation and build a base. And then from there, we can add up and ramp up to get to whatever you have to do, whether that's peaking or testing or, just a competition or multiple competitions but it, for me it was really getting back into sprinting shape and getting my muscles used to sprinting all out um i remember i had to do some testing for like 30 meters and i pulled my hamstring and i'm like well this is why we have to do this <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and then it's the lifting is so different in bobsled too versus track and field like i am so much stronger now than i was when i was in college um because we we definitely lift pretty heavy so that was an adjustment. What kind of lifts are you go doing? back into too? Um, I mean, you're going to have your basic squat, deadlift, uh, power cleans, a big one, push press. And then I like to do a lot of accessory work. I mean, me personally too, training method wise, I do a little bit different than what a lot of my teammates do. A lot of it will be like hit training or like training to failure. So I really like to push my, my mind and my body that way and get really uncomfortable because you have no choice if you're going to do it correctly. And it's worked out really well for me. So, yeah. So what's, tell me the difference between coaching, like the coaching that you got, I'm not trying to get you to bomb on any coaches. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm a coach, so I yeah. get it. But um, the difference between what you were learning at Rhode Island and what you're learning now at the bobsled team, the Olympic world-class bobsled. Yeah, it's definitely different um i mean the sports are completely different there's different sport specific things that you're doing technique wise and whatnot i mean at rhode island i had a really soft spoken head coach or assistant coach but he coached me like in hurdles and the short sprints yeah so i was used to not getting a lot of feedback and here right now um our organization is undergoing some changes and we don't have a push coach which is for my position as a break break woman or a push athlete so it's made it kind of difficult, but I think not having a coach, or I should say having a coach who didn't always give feedback has helped me because we don't have someone right now who's going to be there constantly to give you feedback. Um, but it's also a lot of like lean on each other, lean on each other. You know, I'm around Olympians. Like I can ask them questions. They're willing to help. The other women are willing to help. So we just make do that way for now. <laughs> you video every get off that you guys do. Like uh, we try. You're pushing these yeah. Yeah. We try to get a push videos as much as we can. Um, sometimes it's a little bit harder when we're actually sliding. So going, excuse me, to the bobsled track and doing the full runs versus if we're in the ice house here, uh, it's a lot easier to get someone just to be like, Hey, can you film this rep for me really quick? Yeah. Cause sliding day, it's, it's a lot more like there's people moving sleds. Um, coaches are everywhere there's just people everywhere so it can be a little bit more of a challenge is there i don't yeah, i don't know one thing about it other than what i spoke with <laughs> elliot about but um yeah is it this may sound crazy 
But it, do you count <laughs> the steps before, like you you hop in the in the sled? Is it like one, two, three, four, five, six? It's, <laughs> it's not like hurdling. It's not like hurdling where you right. would count your steps between each hurdle because you be like, okay, this is yeah. my lead leg that I want over. Bob said it's different depending on the pilot you're with. Um, some pilots, if they're faster, might like to run it deeper over the crest. Some might like to run it shorter. So usually I'll load into the sled based off what I know I can do speed-wise and based off what the pilot's doing. But it also depends on the track you're at. Uh, some tracks, the start ramp is shorter than others and flatter or there's more of a crest. So that changes your strategy as well. So I, this yeah. sounds naive, but there's not like a strike that you've got to be in the in the sled by a certain time there's I mean, not a stripe no there's a timing eye that'll be at the end but you definitely want to be in the sled before it's out of the grooves so there's grooves that are cut from the beginning to like a certain distance down it varies on the track you're on um, mm -hmm. but you want to be in loaded before then because if you're not and you're trying to load while it's out you can cause the back of the sled to fish tail and you know our sport's all about time and in driving lines so you don't want that because a skid is going to lose you time right. going down the track yeah have you ever driven so. it you're a pusher right no i'm just a pusher yeah i thought about going to driving school then i decided this is not the path i want to go down so <laughs> yeah it's a lot it's, okay so it's how long different. have you so so we didn't even figure out how you got into this <laughs> that i wanted to and i started looking into it so then you met yeah. somebody made some calls yeah. and then where the yeah. heck did you go so basically I, at the time, and I think they're still doing this, I flew out of Park City and took a combine in person. So we did a bunch of different sprints um, with some timing eyes and get numbers there. We did like an underhand shot toss and a broad jump. And those, whatever numbers you put up, uh, there's a chart that you can look at and it's got points. And if you can get close to the point value they were looking at, they'll call you and invite you back to the Olympic Training Center here in Lake Placid for okay. a rookie camp. So, um, so I came slow to down. You. So that was a combine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, how many how many women showed up to that combine? Oh Ten, gosh, that was a, no. There was a lot of athletes at that combine. I think between men and women, there was about fifty. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and it was the last one of the season that they were holding. Couldn't tell you how many women there were offhand, but there was so a lot of athletes. Essentially, you're talking to somebody. And they say, if you want a shot at this, you got to get out to Park City. We're going to have a combine at such and such a date. <laughs> and is that how it goes down or how's it go down? So, yeah, you, you would sign up for a combine. They have them in different spots in the U.S. So Park City is a big one because there's, a, you know, the track is there and there's athletes there that train. Um, Placid will have some and they've had them in different parts of the U.S. before. But what USA Bobsled had done with COVID is you can do a virtual combine now. And if you go through the GM TM platform, you can search like USA Bobsled Combine and it'll tell you on there the different things they're looking for and you film it, submit it. And then from there, they can evaluate and invite you to a rookie camp. Very cool. And that's your, so, your first so step, you, really. Yeah. So you put up good enough numbers at the combine to where they were like, what yes. they say to you? Did you make like, it the well, first time or, or did you have to wait? <laughs> yeah. No, that was a one a one time thing. Uh, got invited here to like an ad hoc rookie camp. Learned to push a sled. Um, they were like, "Okay, like you're pretty decent enough. We'll bring you back when we're actually sliding here in Lake Placid, so you can go down and get an idea. Like if you like the sport, um, I, I will so say like days, sliding down. How many the days track. of training was it to to uh, the push the sled? Learn oh, how to push the sled, like you said. I think I was I think I was here for two weeks, but I. We only pushed maybe like four or five times. It wasn't what did you that do much. the other whatever? <laughs> <laughs> trained, trained. Well, the ice also opened and there was athletes sliding at that time. I just wasn't allowed to slide. So I would go and just help move the sled and all the other pieces that go along with that. Yeah. So, How yeah. heavy is the sled that you push? So, uh, 375 pounds. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. They're heavy. They're not light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were you like when you first started pushing it? Because you you just ran, you never pushed anything. And when you started pushing, mm -hmm. were you like, what the what? It's definitely different. It helps, like, because I do two women. So you have your pilot on the pilot bar and then me in the back on the brakes. Like, it helps to have another person. But if it's just you for whatever reason, like, I've had a pilot sit in before because 
or push bar wouldn't come up and it was a training run. So she's like, you're just gonna have to push me. It's, it's heavy. You're like, Oh, <laughs> damn, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. You gotta dig, so. you gotta dig down deep. So you go there, you yeah. go to, so you were at park city and then you go out to Lake Placid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so yep. then that was, they're just basically that's training camp. Is that what you said? It was a rookie camp essentially to assess like if you had potential and then they brought me back and they can cut you they can a couple cut you. months later. They could cut you. Yeah, so. They could basically say, yeah, like we met with the coach at the end and he will be like, I think you have potential or I don't think you do. And here are the things you can work on um, for both. And then they invited me back in January uh, for, I think they were having a race here, but I got the opportunity to just take a couple training runs to see if I like the sport because it's very different when you slide down the track versus just pushing a sled, like in the ice house that we have. Um, so that was definitely. So let's cool talk experience. about that sliding <laughs> down the track. What's that like for you? I will tell you the first time I slid and I slid here and I'm going to preface like Buffett is one of the most difficult tracks in the world and really? it's very technical and bumpy. I hated it. I got to the bottom <laughs> and I was like, I don't think I can do this sport at all. And I'm someone who gets motion sick pretty easy. And I actually got really motion sick in the back of the bobsled. Um, because I didn't know where we were. I couldn't see. Like, if you open your eyes, all you see in the back is the break hole. And it's just ice oh. moving. So, yeah, I was really nauseous for about 30 minutes. And they were like, just take some Dramamine and go again tomorrow. You'll be okay. And thankfully, Dramamine has saved me. So every time I slide, I actually take Dramamine oh, to really? make sure I don't get ill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about the G-force, like, on the turns? Does that, like, make you sick? <laughs> uh, well, if you're not expecting it and if you don't know the track, yeah, I can. Because it's pretty high. Like, I, we, we pull five Gs in some of the turns. And it depends on the track. It's Some tracks are more swoopy with higher G-force and some aren't. So. What's five Gs feel like on you? <laughs> you feel like you're being like right on your chest, lawn chair. smashing your <laughs> neck down. Yeah. Or... yeah, no, you literally feel like you're being folded in half like a lawn chair and you are not winning. <laughs> that is crazy. Like you can't win. You can't fight it. Yeah. Like your head will just rest right on the brakes and like you're not going anywhere. <laughs> how, so how many seconds are you in that 5G pull and are you holding your breath the whole time? You're just like squeezing or what are Yeah, you I learned learned you're not supposed to hold your breath the idea is really just to be relaxed and make sure you breathe <laughs> yeah um, but it depends again it depends on the track that you're at like some of the turns where you're pulling those high g's are longer than others it just it depends on the track that you're at did you um, see the newest top gun movie i did see it <laughs> did you relate to that at all um yeah a little bit i'm like yeah we probably pull the same amount of g's but we're not doing the crazy like spins and stuff unless you're crashing which you never want to do but i've been in some of those so have you been in a couple crashes yeah i crashed earlier this year in whistler so whistler is the fastest track in the world um and they that track is known for the thai g forces and we crashed in a turn called 50 50 because back in the vancouver olympics only 50 percent of the sleds would make it through now <laughs> meaning like 50 percent would be successful at driving through and another 50 would crash um they've reshaped the turn since then but yeah i got crashed there in the infamous 50 50 and in a crash you have to get yourself off the ice like pull yourself in the sled otherwise you'll get ice burn um but the g-forces want to suck you out it's really hard <laughs> to so you gotta out. separate yourself from the sled when you're in a wreck is what you're saying you really have two options like you have to either pull yourself in and get your shoulder off the ice because most likely your helmet and your shoulder are on it. Mm -hmm. You've got a few seconds, like we wear a burn vest, which protects us. But if you don't get it off fast enough, you can get second degree burns. Jeez. Um, or your other option is to kick out of the sled, which is something I did. If you're more experienced and you know where you are in the track and you understand what the curves are, um, you can do that sometimes it's smarter but if you do that you kind of have to do like a glute bridge so like the heels on your ice spikes don't get stuck because there's no spikes back there and then the burn vest only runs for part of like your shoulders to about here and then like your upper back so you want your helmet and that on the ice otherwise everything else gets burned they teach so, you how to crash 
or how to survive. Yeah, they give you, <laughs> they give you the safety protocol before you slide. Usually, <laughs> the first. So time. how long is the whole race? It lasts a minute and thirty seconds or something. I can't remember. This no. It, so that's a good question. Again, it also depends on the track. Some tracks are shorter and some are longer. So here, like Lake Placid, is twenty curves. We just came from Park City a couple of weeks ago. That one's fifteen. Whistler was, I think, fifteen. Um, they're all different. They all look different. They're all different lengths. So it, it varies track to track, really. How many? But you do practice? two runs, too. So how many seconds is it? How many? Is it a minute? Uh, really down or, or do you guys just count the turns? And something good happens at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I count the turns and pray. I'm like, God, do not let us crash here, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's some curves more notorious for crashing that you don't want to crash out of. Um, but here, I would say probably like for the women, 57, 58 seconds okay. is about the ride. So have um, you been on, so you've been on those three tracks. Have you been on any other tracks like in Europe or anywhere? Yeah. Italy? Or yes. Or I've wherever. been to Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is my third full season of doing bobsled. Um, so my first year I made world cup and we went. Let's go. Years, so okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm on world cup now on the national team. So it's been awesome. Um, but I've slid in Austria and in Innsbruck on that track. I've slid in Germany, in Winterberg and Kunizi. That one's currently shut down. They have another track there, Altenburg, which we'll go to this year for two races. Um, have not slid in France. Italy's rebuilding the track. And I did, I'm trying to think, I feel like there's another country. Oh, I've been to St. Moritz in Switzerland. Um, and then I got to go to the international training period last October in China on Beijing's new track, which was really cool. So, that was China. Yeah. Because I watched it on TV and I was like, oh, that's <laughs> funky looking. It looks kind of, honestly, it looked kind of trash. I mean, Not the Olympic part, but the other part. <laughs> I mean, I can only speak from the test event piece since I didn't go to the actual games. Um, the track is the most beautiful track I've ever seen. I will say that they did a really good job and the entire thing is covered. So you can actually walk on the roof of that track to get to different parts. It's really wow. cool. Yeah. And they have an indoor warm up area, which was huge. That was really nice. And I think they did a good job, but it's it was true. interesting because we went during COVID. Yeah. I bet it was a lot. Yeah. Shut down, I would imagine. Um, yeah. When you compete, do you get to, how many practice runs do you get to do? And does everybody so get to World, do the same amount? It's a good question. So for the World Cup tour, what we'll do is you show up to – typically this is how it works. You show up to a place, so we're here in Lake Placid, and then you have a week. And in the week, you get two training days, and you get three runs each day if you do those. And you pick between the disciplines. So like the women have two women, and they have monobob. So typically the women will do two women on one day, and then they'll do monobob the other day. And if you're the racing brakeman, you can pick how many of those runs you want. And if you're the alternate that week, you may not slide at all. And then you would slide on race day, which is two runs. What do you do on all the other days? <laughs> uh, you train. You do your regular training. So sprinting, lifting, sports med recovery. I'm usually working. Um, yeah. Recovery. Uh, we also have what we spend a lot of time in the garage doing sled work. That's a really big part of the sport that most people don't realize that we do. We're our own pit crew. So sharpen the doing play. different things with the runners, standing down. Yeah, sharpening the runners, um, making sure the alignment on the sled is right, padding it. You know, the pilots will do some different stuff with their seat and their D rings, which they use to drive. So the garage. I'm will sure there's got to be the regulations. Really there's probably regulations where you yeah. can only. The sled can only weigh this much. The runners can only be that long. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. So when you, beginning of the season, we'll take the runners uh, to the IBSF, so our international federation, and the, to their officials at whatever track we're at. And they go through and they test all the runners to make sure that they're within requirements. And they have like a whole book of requirements and the sleds themselves, like our sled tech, make sure they're all up to standard. Um, and any padding we put in, we have to look at the rule, rule book too to make sure it's within whatever the rules are. So, yeah. yeah well, let's talk about <laughs> one of the most important things. How in the world do you get funded to do this? <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good question. This is why I have a full time job. Yeah. Uh, um, if you, it varies year to year. So, typically, national team or part of the national team will be funded. 
So like the women's side this year, they fund uh, USA one and two. So that just means USA one is like a pilot and it's two brakemen associated with it. And then USA two, same thing. So they're funding two pilots and four brake women on it. So if you can get one of the funded spots, that's really good. That's how you are you there um, yet? And then, are, you, are you there yet? Yeah, I'm I'm fully funded right now. Very yep. cool. So, oh, so I don't have to put a link anything. down at the bottom here. <laughs> Fund Emily. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if people want to, I don't have any kind of donation page set up, but if people are interested, I can. I've never asked for that, I will say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they also yeah, go we fund get me for Miss Emily. <laughs> yeah, I might have to set one up. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, but our federation I ask everybody. I always ask everybody what another rep means. That's the name of this show. Another rep with Coach Hagen, Steve Hagen, and yeah. what's another rep mean to you? Oh, I know. I was thinking about how I was going to answer this question earlier. Honestly, um, I think it's really just putting in that last amount of effort when things get tough or at the end, whether it's mental or physical, and really just pushing yourself to the limit and challenging yourself. And you have to get uncomfortable. And, I would say that. <laughs> yeah. You said you were praying on the way down. <laughs> I mean, I think I'd be praying on the way up. <laughs> it's super cool. yeah. yeah. I love, I love listening to everybody's answers. I mean, spectacular. I can see you're a world-class athlete just by looking at you. And <laughs> I just think it's awesome. I love talking to athletes. I love talking to competitive people that, that do something so uniquely different. Mm -hmm. because, you are. You're different. You're different yep. than the people that sit on the couch and eat bonbons and watch <laughs> TV. You're just, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> you're just rolling, rolling, rolling. So before we leave, tell mm -hmm. me what a day, a, a day looks and feels like for you, just a typical work day. Oh, gosh. <sighs> Typically, it's, you know, wake up, try to get that eight hours of sleep if you can. It doesn't always work that way. Go to the dining hall, get some breakfast. Um Usually it's me working whenever I have free time. And then it's either I'm sliding at the track or we're training, whether that's lifting, sprinting, or pushing. It's one of those things. And that will take up your whole day right there. So, And by the <laughs> time you've had dinner, you're about ready to put your head on the pillow. Usually, yeah. And then you stay up and you do some other things so you can relax or like hanging out with your teammates, do whatever. But usually, yeah, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and crank it up the yeah. next day so where's your next uh competition um so we actually have a world cup race here in lake placid this weekend i opted out to race because i have an ankle injury from my crash in whistler still and i had to get a cortisone shot yesterday hmm. which was not a fun experience but we did it um so i'll we'll probably compete once we get to europe we're going to go to winterberg uh, we leave here December 29th, head over to Europe. So I'll probably race at that point. How can we watch you? Um, IBSF always streams them on their website or they have a YouTube page. So you just search IBSF on IBSF YouTube. IBSF International. On YouTube. IBSF on there. Yeah. International Bobsleigh Skeleton Federation. We just search that. They usually have a live stream on their YouTube page. You may just need a VPN when we're in Europe. Because they yeah. buy the rights over there. But yeah, you can usually watch that. Oh, awesome. Whenever there's races, I always post it on my social media. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, post this on your social media and then you'll get even more well. <laughs> views or looks or whatever. Miss Emily, thanks so much. I really appreciate having you on. And uh, I've learned more about bobsledding in the last <laughs> month than I ever knew in my life. And I love it. I love it. I love you guys okay. competing like that. And it's mm -hmm. just so cool. And it yeah, gives track can. athletes, sprinters, something to do after they're <laughs> done doing what they really do. That's right. It really does. But yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's been so much fun. It's been great to talk to you and answer all your Bob Slice questions. <laughs> <laughs> you have anything else to say? Answer some questions about life. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> oh, gosh. That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> when you find out, give me a call. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> Miss Emily, thank you so much for coming on another rep. I just love hearing your story. You have, you're traveling the world now. You're bobsledding down all the big hills. I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, if you like this show, hit like, hit subscribe, ring the bell, tell your people, do, all, do it all. Do whatever you got to do. I'm going to keep repping. I know Emily's going to keep repping. You keep repping. And I am out. <laughs>